Uh, today, we're delighted to have uh, Brian Wheaton uh, with us. Uh, those of you who don't know him, you should. Uh, Brian is one of our Hoover Fellows, though I'm very sad to say he's going to take off to UCLA uh, next year, temporarily, I hope. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's hear from Brian. You got some slides? Are you uh, ready? Uh, yes, I believe the moderator will be pulling up. Um, How topical, I might say. <laughs> um, uh, so thanks, uh, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm presenting co-authored work with uh, Robbie Minton, uh, who's also here today on uh, inflation in supply chains and empirical test of production network models. Uh, Robbie is my co-author. He's a PhD student at Harvard uh, going on the market this coming year. So I'll make sure to keep an eye out for him. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, the, the COVID pandemic and the uh, subsequent high inflation have revived interest in assessing how input price increases propagate through supply chains in the economy. Uh, over the course of the past five or so years, there's been this profusion of network modeling in macro. And, you know, network models, they predict how this, this pass through um, uh, of cost shocks into prices should occur. Uh, but these models, uh, by and large, haven't been subject to rigorous empirical testing in a uh, causal setting. So what we're aiming to do uh, in our paper is report findings on the speed and extent of price pass through in supply chains, um, discuss some important dimensions of industry heterogeneity in pass through, provide a calvo Keynesian model that can uh, uh, generate these facts and be used for um, prediction of pass-through future shocks. And uh, we're gonna also, um, uh, toward the end of the talk, develop a new measure of core inflation that fully strips out um, not just the direct effects of energy and food price movements, but the full network effects, uh, which we're able to do uh, with our model. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll start out with a brief uh, introduction and uh, let's to review. Um, uh, then we'll get into uh, the empirical strategy we're using and the results. So I want to highlight that um, uh, for the purposes of today's talk, uh, we're not going to uh, get into the details of the model uh, so much, but uh, in our paper, which was circulated, we have a, a lot of detail on the model um, if there's interest. Uh, but as you'll see, the empirical strategy that falls out of the model ends up being very, very intuitive, um, which I'll go over momentarily. Um, so I want to talk about some of the related literature. So uh, the, some of the seminal work on uh, production networks goes back to Leontiev in the 1930s when he was uh, compiling his first input-output tables of the U.S. economy. Uh, over the course of the subsequent decades, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, input-output tables were used um, pretty extensively in a uh, broad uh, a variety of fields. Uh, everything from, you know, uh, some of the early papers in environmental economics to um, uh, work on economic planning. Um, in the late uh, decades of the uh, 1900s, uh, interest in input-output modeling uh, tended to decline a bit. Um, however, this was also the era when some of the uh, seminal papers for today's revival of interest in production networks were written. So, for example, from Holton 1978, there's Holton's theorem, which uh, basically argued that network structures uh, shouldn't really matter that much uh, for uh, aggregate macro outcomes. Um, far from closing the door on interest in production networks, that actually stimulated uh, some uh, new work over the course of the subsequent uh, decades, particularly over the past 10 years. And uh, the basic um, result of all of the papers that I've got listed under that the second bullet is that, in fact, uh, there's substantial evidence that um, network uh, production networks do matter, that industry shocks to specific industries can have meaningful aggregate fluctuations. They don't just all wash out. Um, and there's been a broader literature on product, production networks. So for example, the Bartelman and Grodnichenko paper and the Caliendo Perrin Savinsky paper, um, those sort of zoom out from a domestic production network and look at whether shock specific to one country can affect the global economy um, through sort of a world input output network. Uh, so, you know, there's been a lot of, a, a lot of interest in this topic lately. However, all of those papers are uh, focused on modeling and calibration exercises. There's been a lot less empirical literature uh, on production networks uh, that has aimed to test 
their implications. So um, some of them that do exist, which we'd like to point out are um, the Bohm et al. Uh, uh, paper and the um, Barrett and Sauvignac paper. These are on uh, natural disasters, looking how their effects filter through supply chains focused on output rather than prices. But they only really look one notch up and one notch down on supply chains, not all the way upstream versus all the way downstream, just the direct suppliers and consumers. Um, the Asimoglu et al. and Car Carvalho et al. papers, they, um, they do more work looking fully up and down the supply chains. Um, however, they're focused on uh, measures of output rather than, rather than prices. So the paper that relates closest to ours is this Arlovchenko and Sare paper. Um, but it's again interested in propagation of price movements uh, in the world input output table across international borders. So we're going to be doing a more uh, within country uh, exercise that uh, we believe is uh, more in line with the sort of up to date um, applied micro uh, identification strategies as well. So hopefully we can convince you that we've got some some possible now. Yeah. All right. So with that, let's uh, let's get into uh, the. Uh, the data and empirical strategies. So the data, uh, the main data sources we're going to be using are the DEA input output tables, firstly. Uh, so every five years since 1967, the DEA has uh, released publicly 400 to 500 uh, sector input output tables of the U.S. economy. Um, so these, if you're not familiar with input output tables, they basically just represent interdependencies between industries, uh, the extent to which the output of industry I is used as an input in industry J. Uh, and we're also going to be using these, these uh, industry price series uh, from the BLS, their PPI, Producer Price Index Series. So the BLS has monthly data on industry prices at uh, quite a granular level. Um, they start in the 1940s for the case of a few industries, but there's not very much coverage at first coverage increases uh, substantially over the course of the 1960s and 1970s. So essentially what we're gonna do is merge those two data sets together um, for, our, for our work. So let me give you a sort of a basic uh, intuitive idea of what we're doing. Let's consider oil as a leading example. That's, that's in fact the leading example we, we use in our paper. So oil is used throughout the economy but it's mostly not used directly. So for example, oil refineries do directly purchase crude oil, um, but uh, petrochemical manufacturers will then purchase refined oil from refineries rather than directly purchasing crude. Then, you know, amongst other sectors, plastic and foam producers will purchase from petrochemical manufacturers, furniture manufacturers will produce from plastic and foam producers, uh, et cetera. And so what the BEA input output tables are allowing us to do is uh, to compute each industry's total network cost share, direct and indirect, in oil. So as an example, if 20% of your costs are directly in crude oil and 30% of your costs are in a sector uh, with 50% of its costs in crude oil, then your network share is 35%. It's 20% plus 50% times 30%. And you can also say you've got 20% in first order oil exposure and 15% in second order exposure. That's the basic intuitive idea. Let me give you sort of a picture of what this looks like in the data, what some of these sectors with high uh, and network oil exposure are. So here I'm, uh, I'm plotting both the uh, oil share of cost overall and what orders of exposure it's coming from. So first I'll turn your attention to the, the, the biggest one, petroleum refineries. As you can see, 80% of their costs, as you'd expect, are, are, are in oil, quite high. However, it's almost exclusively first order exposure, so direct purchases of crude oil. On the other hand, let's look at um, the, the one uh, second from the bottom, asphalt paving mixture and block manufacturing. They're buying almost no crude oil directly, but what they are doing is buying a lot of refined oil from the petroleum refinery. So this shows up in them having a very high uh, second order exposure uh, to oil. Uh, so as you can see, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, some variation in both the um, total amount and in the composition of this uh, oil share, network oil share. Brian, can, it's sure. been a while since I went to grad school. Um, I forgot how this works. 
I, I presume these are uh, just input costs, certainly not labor costs. And and do we count capital costs at all? W what's the denominator cost? Yeah, so we uh, we have data on those other things. Um, uh, Robbie, uh, can you remind me uh, whether in these particular calculations we're including uh, labor and capital costs in the denominator? So both of them are in there for this picture. So we have that from the input output tables. Yeah, so that's that's in the input output tables, and you know, in the case ah. of petroleum petroleum refineries, uh, almost all of their inputs that they use other than labor and capital are are oil. But so but you're saying that balances. even that eighty percent of their cost is the crude oil and not the workers, not the plants, not the lawyers, not the rest of it. Okay. So now what what we're showing you is. Um, the industries with the top third order oil exposures. Um, so as you can see, there's uh, uh, you know still, uh, when we go down to top third order exposures, still a lot of overall high exposures uh, between 20 and 30% of costs, um, but it's a different set of, of sectors in some cases. So petrochemical manufacturing is still on there. That's quite high. It has a decent amount of first, second and third order exposure. And, fourth order and beyond, which is what that residual network uh, yellow bar means. But then you also have sectors like um, uh, polystyrene foam product manufacturing, second from top, which has basically no uh, first order and second order exposure. Uh, you just start to see the exposure in the third order and beyond. Uh, so uh, having, having given you a bit of insight into the data, uh, let me tell you about our, our regression approach. So we're going to start with some case studies. So this is the regression approach we use for these, these, these case studies, these specific uh, big oil shocks. Um, essentially, we're going to be using the following regression specification, which is just regressing the cumulative uh, change in the price of an industry up to some period T on a time fixed effect and on um, the network share of commodity Z, in our case, oil, so the network oil share. And the way to interpret this regression uh, is that full pass-through is going to correspond to um, a beta T equaling um, the sum, the cumulative uh, uh, commodity price change uh, up to time T. Um, so, for example, if there's a one log point increase in the price of oil over some period, um, if we have full pass through, this should induce a network share log point increase in industry I's prices. So the full extent of the cost shock being passed through into prices. And we can also run a version of this regression where we split the network share into the first order direct share and to the indirect second order and higher share. Um, to sort of show that, you know, any pass-through we find isn't exclusively driven just by that direct first-order pass-through, but the network also has a bite. And I, I, I want to, ask, I'm sorry, I'm abusing my moderator privileges, but anyone else can jump in too. Um, I just want to understand how this could not be won. Uh, so I guess it could come out of profits, but even that is not going to be permanent. Or is this a, is the hypothesis not one that uh, subst there's substitutability, it's not perfect input outputs? It's sort of an accounting sense in which if you don't substitute, then the pass through has to be one. But so, so Robbie and I, I would say, um, uh, are on board with you on this. However, there's been a lot of, um, you know, arguments made recently, uh, both in academic literature and, um, you know, in mass media that, for example, um, a lot of price pass through or lack thereof may have to do with things related to concentration, to market powers, to monopolies, uh, you know, abusing their power or some such. And so if, if that was indeed the case, we might find that, uh, you know, part of costs end up being eaten by the firm or, or, or vice versa if there are these sort of differences. Um, and so, you know, we're interested in seeing whether that or whether any other heterogeneities, and indeed one of the heterogeneities we look at is, um, is you know, firm uh, market concentration. We're interested in seeing whether all of these sort of um, uh, frictions that people have, have raised would get us away from one. Uh, spoiler alert, they do not. But, um, you know, given that these, uh, this 
and go ahead. Is, is there an accounting identity we could write down where, where we don't have to argue? So, so that, 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 you know, uh, change in profits plus change in plus substitutability plus network share, something like that has to add up to one. And then the question is just, you know, how long did, how long does it take for the profits to return or, or, um, you know, is there a permanent and transitory effect, but we, we kind of know it's all adding up to one and we see all the pieces rather than sort of think of them as residuals. I see. Yeah, that, that's, an, that's an interesting point. Um, yeah, there, there is a sense in which our model makes this, this uh, that sort of thing a little bit more explicit, but it's, it's certainly, certainly we could think about writing out an identity like that to sort of make clear, um, you know, what different things could be responsible for full pass or lack thereof, yeah. John's a bit ahead of me on this, but so if there's an effect on overall inflation, I guess you're saying that's coming from your lambda t term. I mean, it doesn't have to just be the cost direct, does it? So right. So the um, the lambda t, the time fixed effect, would be capturing things like you know aggregate inflation, aggregate mon uh, monetary policy uh, responses, these sorts of things that occur at the national level, because that's the you know that's a time fixed effect. So it's something that's hitting all industries equally, something that you know, might would relate, for example, to the money supply, but that's, that's distinct from this sort of network share channel, um, which uh, is specific to the industry eye that we're, we're interested in. And now Jim's ahead of me. So that's right, because the share, the difference, I thought we were going to doing prices on prices, but you're doing prices on shares. So uh, if a, a currency reform or an inflation would have no effect on the shares, uh is that that's correct right because because your your the cost in the oil are going up but the cost and everything else are going up at the same amount yeah so we're going to be doing a regression in a few slides where we're doing uh essentially prices on prices times the network share um but uh, you know and it, you'll get the same result essentially but um uh, right here, the interpretation is a little different. As I'm saying here, for full pass through, we'd want uh, beta to be equal to the sum of, um, you know, the change in prices, this cumulative price change. Whereas in the subsequent regression we run later, um, full pass through will be beta equals to one. So, so, so this is slightly different. This is a propagation of relative prices, really, that we're measuring, as opposed to a propagation of inflation. Uh, yes, I, I, yes, you could say that. Yeah. Does beta Sorry. t have a name? Beta t. Uh, so I, I suppose we could. Uh, I suppose we could give it a name. Right now, it's just our uh, our coefficient on the, the network share variable uh, pass through coefficient. Yeah. I guess we call it sometimes. Um, well, obvious okay. why is give it a clever you... name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems to me that there's there's a there's a marketing failure here. <laughs> Yeah, we we should do okay. that. How, how do we how do we get it? What makes us an interest? What makes us interested in beta t? Yeah, pass through coefficient. I think is probably the right way. Pass through. Honest. It's the pass through coefficient. It's it has something to do with lags. Is that right? So. Um, I think things will become a little bit more clear when we look at the, the subsequent specification uh, where we're pooling all of the variation and then we're showing individual lags and leads. Here, since we're focusing on specific case studies, we can literally look you know, month by month in the data. Um, so for example, uh, you know, this first case study is the 1979 oil prices. This is a substantial increase in oil prices over the course of 79. And, 80 uh, uh, induced by the Iranian revolution. Um, prior to 79, for the few years before that, oil was uh, at an elevated price relative to the earlier 1970s, but it was uh, somewhat stable. Then we have this shock uh, in 1979. And what the black line here is graphing is um, West Texas intermediate uh, crude oil price. What the blue, uh, let me start with the red dots are graphing is uh, the coefficient on uh, direct uh, oil exposure. And uh, the blue dots are graphing the coefficients on indirect oil exposure. So as we saw in the previous slide, full pass through would correspond to the black line intersecting with the red dots and the blue dots. 
And what we do indeed see is that by the end of our, our period of interest, we have had full pass through of both the direct and the indirect uh, uh, exposure to these oil shunts. Standard error bars are larger on the, uh, on the indirect pass through, but uh, in both so, cases. So is the, is the behavior that's being recorded here uh, something fundamental uh, in which the shock unfolds over time or is it because uh, because of dynamics of the response is this a one time did you consider or is that a material is that a logical question in this framework i don't know. yeah that's uh, so that's a very reasonable question i'm going to punt it for two or three slides when we do the uh the versions that are pooling more of the variation there you'll see the exact time pattern uh, uh that both direct and indirect pass through operates with so back in the old days, Bob and I both remember the 1970s when there was inflation and we used to do inflation research. There was a lot of speculation, for example, that companies had pricing policies where they, the price of oil goes up, but the gas station, the price of oil goes up, they don't raise their prices until they have to pay more for the delivery. So you kind of get the inventories at the old price. On the other hand, that's irrational. They should know that you know the price is up, so they should sell the current inventory at the current price. Hmm. A lot of politicians call that gouging and get mad at it, but that's you know sort of the source of inflation. Now, I, I couldn't quite understand. You had some dynamics in your regression. I didn't quite see them in the plot. Are, are we learning about that sort of slow pass through in the plot? So we're going to be learn after we get past the case studies and now just two more slides, we're going to be learning about uh, that question in good detail. And then we're going to get exactly on this question of whether things are, whether firms wait to sort of pass it through or whether it just matters that they see it all the way upstream and then they change their prices right away. When I get to the heterogeneity analysis even later, we're going to very directly get to that question. But there's, another crucially, there's another crucially important issue here, which is, to what extent are these prices measured in terms of contracts that have set the price uh, for some period of time? Um, and what you're observing is the unfolding of recontracting as opposed to, uh, as opposed to some, you know, John's, John's suggestion that, that gas station operators just sleep through their work and they just mechanically mark up which by the way is completely wrong, but that's another matter. Um, so we, we're, we're very interested in the contracting stuff and uh, we, we wanted to sort of get at a direct empirical test of this. It turns out it's hard to, as far as we've been able to find, to get data directly on, for example, the share of transactions that are a result of uh, prior contracts by, by sector. Um, we have uh, we have some suggestive results that I'll get to later, but yes, it's certainly something we've been thinking about this this, this contracting as to the exact uh, the precise micro way that this is being because uh, um, the, the the oil business t tends to solve this problem by looking at the auction price of West Texas crude for what that's worth. Um, so uh, now the second case study is the 2014-15 uh, oil shale boom. So there was a massive expansion in oil shale production um, in the United States, uh, particularly in places like uh, North Dakota and the Upper Great Plains, over the course of this period. And it led to a substantial decrease over, the, over that period, uh, uh, level shift downward essentially in um, the oil price. So again, here we have with the black line, the oil price plotted, um, red dots, first order um, pass through coefficients, uh, blue dots, the residual uh, rest of network uh, pass through coefficients. And again, we see by the end of the period, um, we've got uh, the coefficients that are consistent with full pass through. There does seem to be for the residual network sort of a lag because it doesn't follow exactly the oil price the way the first order exposure does. So having talked about the case studies, uh, next slide, please. Um, we're going to talk about a sort of more versatile uh, regression approach next that doesn't require an index period where we can pool all the variation. Okay, we're good. going to be regress. Go ahead. It's interesting. I'm trying to understand how you could have the first and second order be different. And it must be that there is less first order pass through to subsidiary things. 
I mean, if, if everybody raises the price of their products immediately when the oil price goes up, then uh, the only way uh, the only way I can't be showing full pass through is that I don't respond immediately to the price of gasoline going up because that's a second order <clears throat> effect. So there's some asymmetry between oil where everybody responds immediately and uh, oil products where people are responding, their first order response to oil products has a lag. So um, on the next slide, I'll show you sort of one by one. So even on the indirect, it's not 100% passed on impact. It's something like 60% in the month of impact and then 20% and then you'll, you'll see the month by month coefficients and it'll sort of, you know, yeah. um, make a bit more But sense. that has to be the case for your second order not to be the same as your first order. That means that the first order is not 100% on the non-oil products. Um, right. So the, the, uh, this regression approach we're using to exploit the pooled variation is essentially we're regressing the industry price on um, the cost shock that the industry has been exposed to. So the network share um, of the industry multiplied by the change in the price of the commodity, um, in this case, oil. Um, and uh, we're, we're adding uh, six leads and 12 lags just to observe, you know, first of all, whether there are any pre-trends and second of all, what the pattern of pass-through looks, uh, looks like over the course of a year after the cost shock hits. And here are the interpretation of the pass-through coefficients, um, as I foreshadowed earlier, is a little bit different. So here, um, the betas summing to one um, uh, would correspond to full pass-through. And here too, it's possible to decompose the network share into direct and indirect shares if we're interested in looking um, as we will be um, uh, at the two separately. And we're also going to run a version of this specification where we instrument the oil price change with Kanzig's uh, series of um, exogenous OPEC shocks, uh, presumably a more plausibly exogenous uh, uh, set of variation than just using all of the price variation. I'm, I'm a little confused by your notation there. It, shouldn't P, Z, J have a T or something? Uh, yes, 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 it, yes, it should. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So, so J equals zero corresponds to T or something. It, sh it should be T minus J or what, what, what is it? I'm asking. Yeah, that, that, that's right, T minus J. Also, to Jim's earlier point, now, this is fundamentally different to be running delta P on delta P Z, because uh, lambda the overall inflation should now show up in this coefficient, whereas overall inflation shouldn't show up in the previous coefficient. Well, we still have the time fixed effects here. Yeah, I mean, it's not clear you should have the time fixed effects. In some sense, you should have um, you should have the other, not just the oil, but all the other prices in there, um, and. Right, I guess the, the time fixed effect is picking up the same regression on on your not just your oil price, but on your plastic price and your your, your food price and everything else. So the time the time fixed effect should be picking up sort of any you know aggregate increases in uh, the price level that are occurring across sectors, um, you know, regardless of how much they were or weren't exposed to uh, to the oil shock. Just with the delta PZ there, it's a very different coefficient. The, the units are different, the interpretation's different. What happens if there's overall inflation is different? But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so we can we can think about that some more, but let, let's, uh, so on the next slide, I'll talk a bit about what's in the error term here. So although we didn't go into the model in detail, essentially, um, you know, the industry wage, the rental rate of capital, and uh, TFP are things that should be in the error term here. So we should be concerned if any of these variables are correlated with the oil cost shock. Now, I um, wanted to note that the time FEs capture aggregate inflation, effects of monetary policy, changes in aggregate expected TFP, uh, things like this. Um, now, the industry wage, uh, one of these things can be measured uh, directly. And if I add the industry wage to our regressions, uh, it induces virtually no changes in the results. So that's one thing I want to point out. Secondly, um, when we do use those more exogenous Kansas series of o OPEC shocks, um, we're hoping that, that this deals with uh, worries or helps deal with worries about correlation to some of these other value uh, variables because we're not using 
all variation in oil prices, which can potentially be driven by a whole uh, range of things. It's just uh, these high frequency identified uh, OPEXs. So what we're doing here, this is using all variation in oil prices, is looking at the extent of pass through of both first order and second order and beyond uh, uh, network exposure. So let's start by focusing on the red coefficients for first order exposure. So what we see is that in the month of impact of the shock, well, first of all, nothing really going on in the, in the pre-period, no, uh, uh, no major pre-trends. And then on the month of, uh, month of impact of the shock, we see a uh, pass-through coefficient of about uh, 0.6. So we've got 60% pass-through already in the first month. Then we get about another uh, 0.2 or so um, in uh, the next month. And uh, after that, it's sort of bouncing around zero. So our pass through for these direct, uh, uh, direct exposure to oil price shocks is uh, pretty rapid. It occurs over the course of a couple months. Now, if we look at the residual network exposure, so second order and beyond exposure, uh, the pattern uh, uh, contrasts with this a bit. So we have a bit of pass through on impact, but not all that much. It, it sort of filters in over the course of the first uh, six months. Um, and then after that, bounces around zero. So we have these different patterns of, of pass-through uh, as you get a bit further from the, the source of the commodity shelf. So another thing you can do is uh, and instead, let's pool first and second order into the red uh, pass-through coefficients and look at third order and above in the blue coefficients. Um, here, if we look at the blue coefficients, there's um, essentially no significant pass-through on impact. Um, but we see it in the second month, third month, and then again, it's sort of uh, filtering in over the course of subsequent months. Um, so as we go a bit further down the supply chain, it's taking a bit longer. Uh, you, have, you have a pretty pretty big uh, prior, two months prior to, to the shock. Yeah, that's... Uh, um, what do you make of that? that? It's, uh, uh, that's, that's some... It's a little strange. Uh, it's uh, just one month in the pre-period. You know, it's uh, bouncing around a, a bit. These are very reduced form uh, regressions, so we're not assuming anything uh, before and after. But uh, yes, it's uh, uh, it's it's a little odd, I would say. Um, one one out of twenty D statistics is always significant. <laughs> yeah, I think that's. Uh, I think that's uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, this is way. This is way more than five percent. This is, this is a p-value in the pre-period. In the pre-period, I'm not sure it's uh, it's uh, you know. Two, well, what what, is, what is the ones. the error bar is 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 what one or two these are ninety percent error bars actually. So uh, oh, okay, ten percent of them. So yeah, let's see. We got twelve in the pre-period and one is. Uh, so the uh, the next thing we do is use the Kansas variation. So here uh, we are going back to where the red coefficients are just first order exposure, the blue coefficients are residual network exposure. Um, we've got a similar pattern uh, that uh, you know we have a tremendous amount of pass through on impact for the first order exposure, and for residual network exposure, it takes a few months uh, uh, to filter in. So it doesn't seem to take quite as long with the cancer variation as it does uh, with all variation. There's a a large part of me loved cointegration and and. You, you ran this in differences, but there's a sense in which one should run it in levels. And that gets back to my accounting identity question. I mean, if you look over, you know, a period when the price, when all prices go up by a factor of two, three, four, mm -hmm. we kind of know uh, what doesn't get passed through has to be substituted away from. So there's a, the, either my price changes with the input price or my share goes down, um, right? You, you're holding the share constant and looking at the change in prices. Uh, but I think that's where the identity, the identity is a co-integration restriction, but it, it would allow that um, if oil prices go up, we substitute away and my share becomes lower. Uh, and those two things, and those, under my hypothesis of long run neutrality, those two things have to add up. Um, I wonder if you can run it in levels in that sense. I know that's a vague thought, but. No, that's, that's a good suggestion. We can, we can think you about doing that. Here, so the master of co-integration might be able to tell us. How we we, uh, we can we can run it. Right? We can try running it that way. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good suggestion. So I want to uh, sort of show you what this looks like if we add them up, so you don't have to add all those coefficients up in your head. Uh, this is just if I accumulate um, the coefficients over the course of uh, that year that we just looked at. Um, 
both for the baseline and the Kanzig IV regressions. Essentially, for both direct and indirect, uh, we find uh, evidence that is, in three out of four cases, very close um, uh, in terms of even a point estimate to one, and in all four cases, um, uh, st uh, statistically consistent with a pass-through of one, full pass-through. And uh, I want to highlight uh, this other regression where we're um, running oil and other commodities side by side. So here we've got both the um, oil network share. We're not breaking direct and indirect out separately uh, anymore, but the oil network share and the network share in non-oil commodities. And we again find this uh, similar pattern where you have a um, decent amount of pass through on impact and then more of it filtering through over the course of the subsequent months uh, here to both sum to something uh, statistically consistent with one. And th that, uh, I, I want to point out that graph is doing two things. So since it's got both oil and all other commodities in the regression um, side by side, it's both telling us that, you know, these non-oil commodities have full pass through as well. And it's also telling us once you've controlled for all these other commodities, we still get that same result uh, on oil. So, uh, you know, we also performed heterogeneity analysis on a variety of variables. In the interest of time, I'll show you every single one here, but uh, we performed it on market concentration, average inventory size, average firm size, shock size, and frequency of price adjustment. We only find evidence of uh, statistically significant heterogeneity on the last of these, uh, frequency of price adjustment. Specifically, we're using data from uh, Pastin, Shonley, and Weber on uh, the average frequency of price adjustment by industry, which they compute uh, using BLS micro data. Take the number of price changes per good, divide by the number of months the good is in the sample, aggregate that to the industry level. Um, so given that we find significance, uh, uh, significance on that heterogeneity, which I'll show you in a, in a slide, we're going to be using that to calibrate an imperfectly flexible uh, model. But first, let me show you the uh, of the heterogeneity. Um, so if we split into, uh, if we split our sample into industries with above and below median price rigidity as measured by this data on frequency of price adjustment, we see that uh, the pass-through is driven by um, industries with higher levels of uh, uh, price rigidity, higher frequency of price uh, adjustment. Um, for all of the other heterogeneities we tested, essentially everything was right on the nose one. This is the only one uh, for which we have uh, uh, this heterogeneity, and it is uh, uh, quite striking. Can I, I do. Can I go back to that? that sure. um, as I remember my micro New Keynesian models, which is not very well, um, the uh, aside for sales, they find incredibly slow price changes on the order of you know once every six months, once every year. Yet that would mean they can't be passing through stuff on a monthly basis. Uh, is there one of these facts that I have wrong, or is, do you have a stunning reversal of the stylized fact that uh, price stickiness is extreme and therefore markups are enormous? Interesting. So um, I guess one thing we could do if the concern was, and this is probably reasonable, especially once you get down to the you know very low frequency of price adjustment stuff. Um, we could accumulate these coefficients so for a greater than one year horizon and look at uh, what's going over, say, for example, a two year horizon that may, that may, that may no, reveal. A you're, you're, you're finding lots of very in, in a month, you're finding 60% pass through. Mm -hmm. so, so people are moving their prices in a month. That's just inconsistent with the view of the world, uh, which may be wrong is going from a lot of papers that, that you know, these prices are, are changed in a very, very infrequent sticky way. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, they're not looking at changes in prices in response to an oil price change. They're looking at something else. Uh, and I forget exactly what they're looking at, but. Um, so at least for the, for- Yeah, Bob will know. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a big Burdett Judd problem in understanding this because these are these are typically markets in which uh, right, uh, firms can locate themselves at, at any given time at a, at a different point in the trade-off, uh, where all points on the trade-off 
um, uh, between uh, volume and, and margin uh, correspond to the same level of profit. So, so individual prices move within the Burjet Chad you know, along the Burjet Chad line. Uh, and that explains the, in the their tendency not to change prices very often. But the aggregate price level is perfectly flexible, and and that problem has never never really been faced uh, in this literature on on this associating the frequency of individual price adjustments with the um, the ability of the market to um, track. So you, you can have you can have very flexible market prices and very rigid. Uh, Firm prices at the same time, and 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 a, a lot of these markets that behave that way, you know, really really seem like they probably do have this predictive character. Yeah, these are all interesting points. You know, we're looking at industry prices rather than individual firm prices, so there's already some level of aggregation going on there. I guess yeah. uh, you know, to to John's uh, to John's uh, point. At what our results are saying is that at least for these um, industry prices, you know, PPIs rather than consumer prices, and at least for, um, you know, responses to cost shocks, either to oil or to these other commodities, there does seem to be for a whole lot of industries some pretty rapid uh, uh, pass through, that, that right. to, you know, month, two months. And yet, if, if you look at, at Carlton's uh, rework of, of uh, old. In BER data set, uh, he, 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 he we're looking at actual individual contract changes. You, you find in the same markets that uh, there's, there's a great deal of, of heterogeneity at any given moment in the, in the contract price. Um, and yet the average price, as you're finding, is, is, is quite responsive. And that's exactly what Rudet Judd uh, forecasts or explains. Interesting. So, yeah. So don't don't hop on this bandwagon of saying that there's a mystery. Um, uh, you know, there, there's there's a pretty good explanation that, that seems to to work. Or, okay. uh, so, so you so so you're finding you're finding of you know, the the industry aggregate prices from the DEA are flexible is exactly in line with with that line of thought. I see. Okay. Interesting. Makes sense. Um, so the one other heterogeneity that I do want to highlight because it has implications for, you know, the micro of what's going on in the background in terms of how these prices are actually being adjusted uh, and whether or not there's a menu cost thing going on is heterogeneity on the size of shops. So what I've done here is on the X axis, we've got essentially the, um, the size of the cost shock and on the Y axis, we've got the size of the price change. And the, um, these are bin scatters. The right panel is for you know, zooming in on extremely small cost and price changes. And so if we had some sort of a menu cost model, we'd expect to see sort of a, a flat a slope around the origin um, in, in the right panel in particular. And we, we don't find any particular evidence of that. It doesn't seem to be the case that there's some region where um, even where there's a sufficiently small shock for which that it doesn't get passed through uh, into prices. So it doesn't seem to be that there's some sort of manifest model uh, going on uh, in the background. Yes. Oh, a moment ago, you were talking about the Kanzig shocks. Mm -hmm. Are you using those in that picture? Or is that every year as a dot? Um, uh, I believe we're not using the Kanzig variation in, yeah, we're not using the Kanzig variation. Just every year you change. Be. Yeah, that, that would be all of the uh, oil price variation. Yeah. You know, as, as I mentioned, uh, in the interest of time, we're not going into the model uh, in detail here, although um, I'll refer you to my, uh, my paper if you're, if you're interested. Uh, essentially, once we, uh, we you know, set up this uh, imperfectly flexible New Keynesian model, calibrate it with that frequency of price adjustment data, given that that's where we saw the significant heterogeneity. Um, we, we can get uh, something that uh, essentially spits out these IRFs uh, by industry based on how flexible prices are in that industry, how frequently it's, its prices are adjusted and what the um, oil cost share is of that industry. So just to give you 
a few examples. The model um, says to us that for petroleum refineries, that top purple line, we're going to have um, very rapid pass through and it's going to be pretty large since the um, you know, oil share in that uh, sector, as we saw previously, was quite large. On the other hand, for something like um, carbon and graphite product manufacturing all the way at the bottom there, most of its uh, exposure to oil is in third order, fourth order, fifth order, and beyond. Um, and consequently, we get this uh, sort of lag pattern. Uh, next slide, please. So essentially what we can do to test whether these uh, IRFs coming up from the model hold up in the data is just regress the actual industry price uh, changes on these IRFs that came out of the model. So Could I ask I'm you to just go back a, a second to the previous sure. slide? Mm -hmm. I was I was struck by your natural gas. Um, is that the, or? Natural gas distribution. Are, they go up very slowly. Now natural gas is a substitute for oil. So I would expect their prices to be rising in response to an oil price shock, but for a totally different reason, not because you know, they, they, they need, I guess, more diesel fuel to run their trucks, but simply because the price of your competitor went up, so your price goes up. Um, am so I, I doing that wrong? That, that seems like we should somehow be not having that effect. Or... So I should, uh, I, I should highlight two things here. Um, so first of all, we've run um, uh, regressions where we, you know, in addition to controlling for all other commodities, we can like specifically control for natural gas, coal, for you know these various other substitutes uh, uh, for oil, and show that we still get you know the same result. Um, the other thing to highlight is that uh, in uh, in the input output tables, um, oil and natural gas extraction um, uh, by default are pooled together. Uh, so uh, uh, this this here is sort of a result uh, of that. It, it still does, goes through when you do those controls, but that's, that's... I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm still hung up on on levels and on identities. Uh, in some sense, uh, you know, you're, you're estimating one of the responses to higher prices is we'll substitute away from it, and um, we should be we should be uh, one of the things you do is you just pass the price on to your customers. But the other thing you do is you substitute away and you use less of the stuff and, and, and then you pass on less of the price to your customers because you were able to substitute to something else. And it, it would just be kind of fun to see to what extent that happens as opposed to sort of take input output stuff for, for granted. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. We can, uh, we can definitely look into that more. Um, so here we're just regressing the price changes in the data on these model IRFs for each industry. Um, and here, uh, essentially, beta is equal to one uh, will mean that the model's predictions hold true uh, in the data. So essentially, um, if we use all oil price variation, uh, we get coefficients that are in point estimates, generally a bit larger than one, but uh, statistically consistent with one in all cases. If we use the Kanzig variation, um, we get coefficients that again are, are bigger than one. And in the case of impact in the first month after impact, it seems to be a, a statistically at least 90% level bigger uh, than one, which suggests that in the data pass through is actually a bit, um, a bit faster than the model is, is uh, predicting. But on the whole, it seems to perform uh, uh, reasonably uh, well. But, you know, this is different. You, previously, you showed that, as you'd expect, uh, if you use the Kanzig instruments to pay a very heavy price in precision, but here it looks like uh, you don't pay anything. You, all, all variation on Kanzig have the same error bars, right? Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Um, uh, yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not uh, not sure what's responsible for that. I mean, here it's being. If it, it's being filtered through the model in, in, a, in a different way, but we can we can think more. Robbie, do you have a sense of, of why that might be here? I don't. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. If an RA brought these results to me, <laughs> yeah, I would ask for some review of the calculations. So, yeah, we can think about uh, about why the standard errors might not blow up there. And, uh, I mean, in general, it's not. Uh, 
it's not obvious. It wasn't necessarily obvious earlier on that they should have blown up uh, with the Kanzig instrument because you could have made the argument, well, there's more precision. No, you're sorry. No, but, you're, you're, but they did. In fact. So that's interesting. Well, they I think here. generally speaking, uh, that's what you're, you the 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 instruments are only only expose a limited amount of the variation, um, and and therefore you know just the. The, the less variation there's in the right hand side of the regression, the, the less precision there is in the estimates. But yeah, the, yeah. But, and that's what you were getting before. And so I said, oh, this, this makes a lot of sense. And then I saw these other results. It's yeah, yeah, that, I, I, that, I, that I, fundamental I rule got, yeah, but anyway, we'll look forward to. Yeah, uh, we can look into that and see what's going on. Do you want to tell us a little bit about before we do the new version of the model? Like, unless I didn't know what the old version of the model was. Yeah, so you, want to, you know, I want to talk about what the model is. Well, um, uh, let's see how how much longer do we have left at this point? Uh, it's one oh five. We stop at one thirty. But yeah, choose what you want to tell okay. us about. I just I, I, I'm not catching much of it because I have no idea what the model is. Yeah, um, essentially, it's a um, you know, it's a standard uh, new Keynesian model with uh, we're calibrating using these uh, frequency of price adjustment. I don't know, Robbie. Is there a way that you can think of, Robbie, to maybe uh, summarize it uh, quickly, or, um, or do you think it's for the rest of it? You, you, yes, I can try. We'll see how this goes. But uh, so in each industry, you have this continuum of firms, and so uh, some share of them, the share that's given by what Brian just explained, will have the opportunity to change prices in each period, and so there will be an optimal reset price that all of that continuum in each industry can solve for in every period, but only some share of them will actually get the opportunity to set that price. Um, and so in full generality, they'll use rational expectations in picking that reset price. So it'll still have all the standard New Keynesian intuition of if they expect inflation in the future and they know they can't change prices immediately, they will price that in today. Um, we're going to get into shortly um, if they're expecting upstream in cost uh, increases from, say, an oil price increase in the future, they are also supposed to pass that through um, today, even before they've seen their costs go up, uh, and so on. So yep. that's kind of the except that's kind of the model in the background. New, new Keynesian Phillips curve, except the pi is a is a, a rel it's an industry or relative price, not the absolute price. That's right. But also on this, on the first, <laughs> these are marginal here, cost shocks, basically. Oil shock the is first, like the, the first sub bullet here. Uh, it, it, the, this this New Keynesian model shares something with all successful practical New Keynesian models, which is that it it ditches most of the forward looking structure and replaces it with what they call indexing, which is basically. Uh, uh, Looking to the past, um, so so the the variation that's here is not as stark as you might think because uh, the, the NK literature is, has basically found that forward looking full forward looking behavior doesn't work very well. Interesting. So uh, what I'm what I'm about to show you is that it does seem like we're getting some extra bite uh, if we uh, from the you know full rational expectations version relative to the myopic version. Uh, which say as as Robbie um, described in the pre preceding version, um, you know uh, the firms are accounting for expected future cost changes. So we can do this myopic version where they believe they're, they're not accounting for that. They believe the optimal reset price tomorrow is the same as as today. And what we can do is see whether there's if we look at the gap between um, the estimate that comes out of the rational expectations version versus the myopic version, does that gap have any um, ad additional pr predictive power? Does it give us yeah. any uh, additional but, but bite? That, that takes you to exactly where the NK literature is now anyway, which is that, that they have a, put a coefficient on this uh, uh, backward looking and, and the, the model itself is a, is a weighted average of the forward looking and the backward looking. Which it seems to me is basically what you're doing too. Hmm. So, so you fall in other words, you you made it sound like it was something different, but I think that's your your practice is standard NK practice. Yeah, 
I see. In, order to, in order to make NK work. <laughs> I see. So this is just showing that um, whether we use all oil variation or whether we use the Kanzig variation, um, there does seem to be some additional predictive power, some additional fit uh, uh, we get from using the rational expectations version. So the coefficients on the uh, on the left of each of these two plots are just the myopic pricing version of the model alone. Um, the coefficients on the right are the gap um, uh, between the myopic pricing version and the rational expectations version. And it does seem to be that we get a bit of extra bite there. Next slide, please. Sorry, sorry that, that could you could you linger over that a little longer? You went so fast. What what do the bars show? Sure. So um, as before, when we were uh, when we were testing the uh, fit of the model with the data, um, a coefficient of one would correspond to the model reflecting what's in the data correctly. Um, now we break our total, you know, uh, uh, the total prediction of the rational expectations version of the model into what comes out of the myopic model and then the gap between the myopic model and the mm -hmm. rash, full rational expectations version of the model. And we're interested in whether there's any additional predictive power of that gap, whether that gap, uh, you know, uh, adding that in leads to um, uh, predicting the data any, any better than if we just use the myopic version on its own. Yeah, okay. And so that's, what, a, that's the weighted average. That's the weighted average that I was mentioning before. I see, yeah. Isn't that the, isn't that you can, so, so what you get is, is somewhere between uh, uh, forward looking and, and something, something not so forward looking. Uh, well, but, this is saying, what, 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 what that, I have so much arthritis in my neck, I can't turn it enough to read the vertical axis, but what's the vertical it, axis here? It just says fit, uh, fit estimate null equals one. So, um, you know, does the model fit the data? And okay, what, uh, what, 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 what's the measure of that? It's just essentially that same sort of go back a couple of slides. Maybe. It's essentially a version similar to this regression where we're um, regressing the actual price change on um, what the model tells us, but we have two separate terms. One term is what's coming out of the um, myopic version of the model and the other term is the gap between what's coming out of the rational expectations version of the model and the myopic version. Um, and if the rational expectations version offered no additional predictive power, then uh, there would be a coefficient of, of, of zero. Okay, and beta, beta is the, so, so and then you, sh you show us the value of beta for different J's, is that what that, uh, so in in the ver that's what I showed you in the um, in the version where we we're just testing the rational expectations um, the version of the model uh, to summarize things in the version I just showed you and put them side by side. I, I'm pooling all of those and I'm just looking at the. But but if you get a beta of one half, does that does that mean that that sort of actual behavior is of of prior setters is is half what the model would predict from rational expectations. Right, so if we get a beta of a half, that means yeah. that- Okay, uh, okay, fine. Stick. So, so, so beta, beta is one minus the coefficient, which is called indexing uh, in the new NK literature. I see, okay, good to know. Um, uh, forward three or four slides, please. Uh, yeah, so I, um, let's skip this one in the interest of time. So one other thing uh, we do, that, you know, sort of an application of our methodology, um, is to make a new measure of core PCE. So we observe that the official measure of core PCE inflation, it excludes a few categories from total PCE inflation. You know, it takes out food and beverages purchased for off-premises consumption, gas and other energy goods, and electricity and gas utilities. But as we've been showing throughout the talk, this leaves oil and other commodities entangled throughout the production network. Um, so, you know, the influence of price, price movements of oil and other commodities is still gonna be partially present in core PCE inflation. 
Um, consequently, we can use our computations of network oil and network commodity inflation to fully strip out these, uh, these influence and develop sort of, a, sort of a revised measures of, of core PCE. Um, you so know, there was, a, there was a, a brief gap when, when Powell at least uh, decided that it was a good idea to redefine core by also removing the price of all durables. And, that, and the Fed actually sponsored that number um, around the time that he gave his famous Jackson Hole speech. I see. What? Changing monetary policy. I mean, with our approach in theory, you could, if you wanted to, remove the, the full network influence of whatever good or commodity you want to take out there. So suppose you're interested in taking out just the, you know, network effects of, um, of uh, you know, microchips. Then you can strip that out, strip that right. out, and see you know <laughs> exactly. what remains. It's an, yeah, this 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 game got started, you know, in, in the nineteen seventies, and uh, a well known economist said, uh, "Well, what we do to measure inflation is remove the prices of all products where the prices have gone up, and that's our definition of core." It's, it's, it's almost that bad. It's almost that bad. There's a justifiable <laughs> version of the exercise, which is you want to um, use the components of the CPI which best forecast the future CPI. Absolutely. Yeah. And, <laughs> but that is, you, you can do that. That doesn't just come down to removing things uh, you know, that you think are sticky or unsticky. You could run that regression. And has, has anyone done that, Bob? That, that... Even I have done that, even though I don't really believe in this. Yeah, no, that's been widely done, but but that's assumed some some stationarity of the of the of the economy, and As we always uh, do. It, it, and, and when you get crazy, you know, unprecedented things like we've had over the last two years, uh, you have to rerun that regression, and it, it loses its compelling power. Well, that that um, means you don't have something stable anyway. Uh, so, back back to something yeah, stable. Yeah. I hope, Brian. <laughs> Um, so uh, this slide is essentially just showing that there is uh, predictability of uh, core PCE inflation using our measures of network oil inflation. Uh, and so in other words, there's still some, you know, there's still some oil variation knocking around in, uh, in core PCE that's sort of tied up in the network. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, what we're doing here is we're saying, let's take uh, PCE inflation and take out uh, network oil. Um, so as we can see here, uh, the 1970s episodes of inflation, uh, they, they're still quite high. Uh, they go down, um, uh, you know, a bit if you take out direct exposure to oil and a bit more if you take out indirect uh, exposure to oil. This is an annual inflation year by year. Um, however, still, uh, still quite high. You'll notice that taking out um, direct and indirect oil exposure does not have much of an effect on the 2021 episode of inflation. Next slide, please. Um, and so the other thing you can do is take out uh, all other uh, commodities as well. So the, you know, essentially everything with a NAICS code of 22 and below, um, you know, agricultural commodities, stuff you mine out of the ground, the natural uh, resources you extract. Um, so uh, this, uh, this slide, but not the next slide, it makes it look kind of like if you do that, then 2021 inflation gets back down into the normal range. However, it turns out that this is driven by the second and third quarters. So go to the next slide, please. Now, oh, there you go. <laughs> by the time you get to the last quarter of 2021, it looks like uh, the gap has, has minimized. So it's no longer the case that just stripping out this direct and indirect commodity exposure gets you back into the normal region. Um, it's been uh, uh, more deeply ingrained, it seems, by the last yeah. quarter of 2021. <laughs> so uh, much for Putin's price hike. <laughs> So uh, in conclusion, um, uh, we find that pass through of commodity shocks throughout the network is gradual. It occurs over the course of six months, but it seems to be a fall. This result appears to be quite general. It's true for specific large oil shocks, for Kanzig series of OPEC driven oil price variation, for all oil price variation and for all commodity price variation. 
Uh, we find um, evidence of heterogeneity on frequency of price adjustment, but not really on any other margins. Uh, we create an imperfectly flexible uh, NK model calibrated with frequency of price adjustment, uh, which approximates the data reasonably well, allowing for prediction of the effects of future commodity shocks. And finally, we use our approach to develop a new core PCE that fully strips out uh, commodity inflation. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for uh, attending and for your questions and comments. Anyone have any uh, additional questions? If now, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> You're in your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> but this idea that that uh, it's it's somewhat useful to to bring uh, uh, the new Keynesian models, which typically, as Larry Summers pointed out, new Keynesian models at the, at the money conference a few weeks ago. Um, uh, you, you get these crazy uh, behavior uh, if you if you run a new Keynesian model through the present um, because we have these you know it, it's impossible to get that model to generate such large bursts of inflation as we I, I disagree with that vehemently, Bob. Uh, throw a fiscal shock at the new Keynesian model and and it fits beautifully. You just they threw out the fiscal side of their models, but uh, okay, that's well, coming from throwing the conventional out the, the conventional. <laughs> If, if you have a model that doesn't have a fiscal side and you throw six trillion dollars of helicopter fiscal on the economy, duh, it's not that. I don't know. I, uh, Michael, please. <laughs> now, first of all, I apologize for joining late, but I teach from 11 to 1, so this already may have been answered, but the flavor of this uh, frequency of price adjustment seems to um, be kind of a this this issue is a big issue maybe 20, 25 years ago, maybe Bob and John will be more of an intellectual history historian and macro, but when people, including John Taylor, were writing about staggered wage and price uh, setting and its implications, and I'm wondering if you have any insights into what we're, we're learning um, that may be new relative to that or may reinforce the lessons from that. Yeah, so... Um... Essentially, um, you know, we, uh, I, I skipped this part a little bit, but uh, one thing we were interested in with the frequency of price adjustment data is, does it seem to be the case that um, the fact that there's this slower adjustment, the slower pass through uh, more downstream when you get second order, third order, et cetera, exposure relative to uh, first order exposure. Is it just because they're further downstream and it's taking time for things to filter through the supply chain? Or is it because um, it seems to be the case on average, and, and this is true, that the more downstream firms um, just have lower frequencies of price adjustment? Um, so we, we want to look into that in a more you know reduced form empirical way, but essentially what our um, what our results on that rational expectations gap are, um, you know, reportedly telling us is that it does seem to be the case that, you know, uh, the frequency of price adjustment um, matters at least as much as just this, uh, you know, downstream this thing. It does seem to be the case that firms are observing what's happening upstream, uh, integrating this to some extent in, uh, in their uh, expectations and their price setting behavior. And then as soon as they're able to actually adjust prices, the next time their frequency of price adjustment comes up, uh, they, they, they change their prices. So, um, yeah, you that's, that's some, you, you think, do you want to incorporate more learning and, and make the frequency endogenous? Is that where you're headed? That's, that's an interesting thought. Um, Robbie, have you, have you, uh, thought about that at all? Or do you think that's something you could do? I think, yeah, so that's interesting. One direction we thought to go was, um, I think strategic complementarities is a big thing people are talking about these days. So one reason a firm may not increase their price is they're worried that their competitors will not, will, will not increase prices at the same time. Um, we've kind of stayed away from that just because we thought that oil shocks are fairly common shocks. And I think maybe that's the case for many commodities as well. So it's not like maybe half the firms in the industry get the shock and the other half don't. And so you do really have this worry. Um, but so we're, I think we're thinking about how to get more endogenous uh, 
uh, price adjustment to occur at, in this sticky way. Uh, but, but right now we haven't figured out a good way to do it. Well, Bob made a good point. There's this West Texas crude, there's, there's the sunspot, the coordination mechanism that, you know, if the price of arugula goes up, you might not know exactly where it comes from, but, but everybody knows the price of West Texas crude came up. So it's kind of more like a currency reform in that respect. Yeah, although I think though that the rest West Texas oil fields are, are so depleted that it's no longer a good standard. <laughs> so I have to find another one. Well, that's it. Um, thank you, everybody. This was great. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Robbie. Um, very nice talk. Uh, and um, I, I forget the schedule, or I, if I knew it, I would announce the next one, but you'll, you'll get an email. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.